You don't have to let it do that. And with every thought that comes, it says every thought, bring it under obedience to the Lord. You have that power to decide how long a thought stays. Hmm. Thank you, Lord. In James chapter 1, verse 13, it says, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one's tempted. Say, each one. Each one is tempted. Say, I am. I am tempted when I am drawn away by my own desires and enticed. Then when desire is conceived, where does desire conceive at? In the mind. Where does the desires live? In your heart, your mind, in your knower, in your thinker. That's where it lives. You don't desire. I mean, you, 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 you desire in the mind. That's where you desire. It says, when I've been drawn away from my desires and I'm enticed, that's when I'm tempted. Then, when desire is conceived, it gives birth. Now, it says it gives birth to sin, and when sin is fully grown, it brings forth death. Now, let's, let's, let's put it into a different perspective. Let's put fear into this, not sin. This is talking about when you've been tempted by something evil and then you fall into sin. But let's, let's throw in fear, like that report I was talking about. You go to the doctor, the doctor says this, boom. Once you believe the report of the doctor, fear enters in. You haven't been drawn away by your own lusts and desires. You don't desire the symptom. You don't desire the report. But what has been, what drawed you away was the fear. And when the fear enticed you, you fell into fear, just like you fall into, temp, into sin. You fell into fear. And when fear is conceived, something is birthed from it. See, fear, just like sin, fear Every emotion that you'll ever experience is conceived at some point in your mind. Everything. So if you want to remain in joy, you you can't... I'm sorry, I'm going to be blunt. You can't have sex with fear if you want to give birth to joy. You have to have joy conceived in the mind to, to birth joy. But when you have fear being conceived in your mind over and over again, how do I do that? By watching the stupid news, by watching what the world's putting out, by listening to so-and-so who's not even a believer tell you about all these symptoms, by getting all the garbage in your mind, you're conceiving fear over and over and over again. What do you expect is going to be birthed at the end of this? You'll have a quadruplets of fear. How do you reverse it? Conceive something better. Sin conceives in the heart. Fear conceives in the heart. Joy conceives in the heart. Faith conceives in the heart. See, everything that you, have, that you are birthing, everything you're experiencing, Proverbs says, as he thinks in his heart, so is he. There's power in your imagination. And you have control over it. Man, how good is our God for giving you control over this crazy power? Say, I'm, I'm going to make you and I'm going to make you with this part in your brain that thinks. I'm going to put that in you. And then I'm going to give you power to control it. <laughs> Whatever you do with it, that's up to you. You can use it for good. You can use it for bad. But I'm going to give you control over your mind the bible says that god has not given us a spirit of fear but a power love and a sound mind we can control what we think about has anyone ever told you that before you can control what you think about isaiah says he will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on him because he trusts in him If your mind's not on him, it's because you don't trust on him. And because you don't trust him, there's no peace. You want to stay in joy? 
you got to keep your eyes on him. You got to get every high thing that exalts itself against God, bring it down underneath obedience to the Lord, and put back into its place the word of God where it needs to be in your life. Thank you, Lord. The definition for imagination is the act or power of forming a mental image of something not present to the senses or never before wholly perceived in reality. I go back to that dog illustration. You guys thought of a dog in your mind at some point. It wasn't here. Did you see a dog barking around? No. But in your mind, you perceived something that was not present, right? Well, every single thing that fear tries to tell you is real, if you took a step back and looked at everything from a different perspective, you'd realize it's not even here. What, what fear is trying to present as real isn't even a reality. It's, it's a what if. It's a maybe this happens in the future. We don't take risks because we're afraid of what could happen. That's thinking of something that's not actually here. It's thinking of something that's, that's made up in your mind. Mm. Thank you, Lord. Are you receiving something today? If you're still taking notes, write this down. You need hope. You need hope. Romans 8, chapter 24, says, or Romans chapter 8, verse 24 says, we are saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. I believe hope is the Bible's way of, of defining a positive imagination. A positive. Remember every... Pretty much every instance of imagination in the Bible is referring to something bad. We cast down imaginations, vain imaginations. But with this, it's saying we're hoping, we're saved by this hope. But a hope that we see, why do we hope for it? It's right here. You don't have to imagine it. But what you, ha you have to imagine a hope that you cannot see, right? The hope that oh, I can't wait to get to heaven. I can't wait to see God Almighty in his glory. I can't wait to, to be in heaven and see all these people and, and, and talk to Abraham and talk to Moses and talk to all the great men and women of faith in the Bible. I can't wait. I can't see them right now, so I hope for that. It's using my imagination. But I, I can't hope for something that's right here because it's here. Why do you have to hope for it? So I believe that that's a positive imagination. Hebrews 11 says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Another translation says, faith is the confidence, the assurance, the title deed to things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Again, it's, it's dealing with this, this reality that it's not here right now. I cannot see it. But I believe it's there. It's hope. It's a positive imagination. Mm. Hope isn't just wishing. Hope is actually believing. It says faith is the substance of things hoped for. In other words, if you hope for something, faith has to accompany it. If you're hoping to see your healing, faith needs to accompany it. Faith is the substance of that hope, meaning it's, 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 it's what makes the things you hope for actually come to pass. The things that you imagine in your head, you can't just imagine, well, I can see myself healed, but I'm not going to do anything about it. I'm not going to believe for it. I can see, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to renew my mind to it. I'm not going to do any of that. It's Faith needs to accompany hope. They need to come together. Number three, keep your mind on Jesus. 
I read this earlier, and you can read it on the screen. Isaiah 26, 3, you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. How do you do that? How do you keep your mind stayed on him? How do you keep your focus on him and not on everything else? He's not here. We can't see him. We can't talk to him. We can't shake his hand. How do we keep our mind stayed on someone we cannot see? By staying in God's word. By keeping his word at the forefront of my mind. Now, when Stephanie and I were, were barely dating, she lived over in Tulare, and I lived on the very north side of Visalia. So I had to drive an entire city all the way to go see her every single day for two years. If that was a business, I would have had a lot of tax write-offs for gas and deductions. But, I, I mean, I drove pretty much every day to her house. And, or, or I went to her house, picked her up, and came back to my house and then took her back home. It was a drive. But it was a, it was a long, long drive. And, I mean, we saw each other pretty much every day. But the times that we didn't see each other, how did I keep my mind on her? Hey, what are you doing? Do you want to see me tomorrow? Do you want to go to dinner, dinner tomorrow night? And we would have this communication. And then at the end of every single night, we would get our phones and we'd put them on speaker. And we'd be on the phone all night long. And then we'd fall asleep and then wake up and we'd throw on the phone together. And that was our relationship. We always just wanted to be in communication with each other, even when we weren't seeing each other, even when we were apart from each other. And I mean, if, if Jesus had a phone, that would be pretty cool. But he has the word. He has the word. He doesn't need to text you anything. He already texted everyone everything right here and then said, all right, end, period. Don't bother me. Here it is. He already gave, gave us everything we need to know. So how do you stay on him like a relationship, how I stayed on her, my mind stayed on her. We were in constant communication. I thought about her all the time because we were always talking to each other. And this is his way of talking to you. People say, I have a hard time hearing from God. Why? He wrote the whole thing right there. What do you want? You want him to yell from the mountains and scare the whole city just for you? You know, one time I was over at the gas station on Acres and Cyprus. At Flyers, I think it's a Flyers gas station. CBC is right there. Cigna is right there. I was filling up my gas tank one time, and, and I don't even know what day it was or what time it was. I was just filling up my gas. And I wasn't paying attention to anything. I was minding my own business and watching the dollars go up and the gas go up. And this was a few years ago, so gas was still a good price. And then out of nowhere, I was filling it up. I hear this booming loud voice. And it, like, startled me. I almost dropped the thing out of, my, out of the gas part of my car. And it startled me. My heart was pumping. I was, like, looking around, like, what the heck was that? And then I looked over at CBC's football field, and there was a game going on. And it was the, the overhead commentator announcing one of the players. And I just started thinking, man, if that alone startled me, imagine God speaking in a loud, booming voice. How crazy would that be? That was insane. So that put into perspective, all right, Lord, thank you for speaking to me through your word and through your quiet Holy Spirit and not through a loud voice because I would die if I heard something like that. It was just the football thing was loud for me and it scared me. I can't imagine hearing God's giant voice, his Matthew. I can imagine it kind of sounds like mine. I'm created after his own image. <laughs> Vocal cords and all. But you keep your mind on him by reading his word. Standing on the word. Again, putting every thought under the obedience of Christ. Amen? Amen. Thank you, Lord. In Proverbs 23, I'm just going to read a couple of scriptures. For as he thinks in his heart, so is he. Again, your life is going the exact way that, that you're thinking. You're, 
Your dominant thought is, is directing the way your life is going. Just like how uh, you can't have a pregnant lady drink this and then have another lady drink it and expect to get pregnant. That's not how it works. I can't piggyback off of someone else's faith. I can't piggyback what Jeff told me yesterday and hope it works for me. I have to plant it in my heart and conceive it in my life. I can't just hear it. I can't just stand next to someone and and rub some of that anointing on me. I need to have it for myself. You need to have it for yourself. This is great. The Bible says, do not forsake the assembly of the church. Don't forsake this. But this isn't enough. It's only once a week for five hours. It's not enough. You need to continue this on your own. After we leave today, you go home. You get the word. You study what, I, what we preached about. Find something else to, to study. Whatever. Just study the word of God. Monday morning comes around. You have work at 8 o'clock. Get up at 6 o'clock. Get up at 6 o'clock. Read the word from 6 to 7. Make breakfast and go on your day. Get the word in your heart as much as you can. You need to conceive it for yourself. You can't just piggyback off of someone else's experience. If I can have the band come back up. Thank you, Lord. There was a a time in Jesus' ministry where, in all honesty to, to most people, it would have looked like a failure to the ministry. Imagine this great man of, of, of faith and this great healer. Imagine you heard so-and-so healing minister is coming to town and he heals everybody and he comes and he does his service and you come up for prayer and he lays your hand and not a single person gets healed. Not a single one. Thousands of people coming. Not a single person gets healed. People would consider that a failure. Well, Jesus had a similar experience where he was going back to his hometown. He was healing people, casting out devils, preaching, doing the work of the ministry. Then he comes back to his town and he sees the people and the people who said, isn't that Jesus, the carpenter's son? What's he doing over here? Who is he? I saw him when he was 12 years old pretending to preach at the temple. What what is he doing? And it says, in verse 5, is he, he could do no mighty work there except lay hands on a few, which is more than what most people are doing. Except lay his hands on a few sick people and he healed them. But he couldn't do any mighty work there. Not because Jesus was powerless, because the people weren't expecting. The people could not get the image. It was his hometown. They couldn't get the image of hometown Jesus out of their head. I'm blessed because I have a family that receives the word from their grandson, from their nephew, from their cousin, from their son, from their son-in-law, from their brother-in-law, from every family relation you can think of, I'm able to minister to them. In most cases, family won't listen to you let alone you being the younger one. I'm blessed. But the people in his life, they only imagined who he was growing up. Little baby Jesus whose diaper had to be changed. Baby Jesus who probably cried because he was hungry. Who is this guy? Jesus? You're telling me Jesus? Is the Messiah? No way. You're telling me he can heal? No way. I know. I knew him when he was 10. I knew him when he was 13 years old, running around the streets. I knew him. There is no way that that little boy can be the Messiah. He could do no mighty work. They didn't conceive the truth. They had a vain imagination. Although they knew God, They did not glorify him, neither were they thankful, and they had a vain imagination. I'm going to give you one last story. It's about David, King David. Before he was King David, he was shepherd boy David. And in in, uh, 2 Samuel, 
or 1 Samuel chapter 17, the scripture says, This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand. David was standing in front of, the, in front of Goliath. The Bible people and scholars say that Goliath was somewhere around 12 to 13 feet high. And David was this little shepherd boy, 13 year old at the most, but this small, standing in front of a Goliath that was probably that big. And he says, surely this day the Lord will deliver you into my hands. And all he had on was his, his cloth, maybe a sash, and a little slingshot with five smooth stones. Well, here's Goliath with all of his armor, armor that probably cost a fortune, a sword that probably weighed more than David himself, and his entire Philistine army behind him. And here's David. God will deliver you into my hand. But then he goes on. I want you to look at this. He says, the Lord will deliver you into my hand. I will strike you and I will take your head from you. And this day I will give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth that all of the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. What did David do? He imagined this. He said, you know what, I'm not going to just kill you, Goliath. I'm going to slay you, and then I'm going to chop your head off just for good measure. Jump down to verse 48. So it was when the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David that David hurried, ran towards the army to meet the Philistine. Then David put his hand in his bag and took out a stone and he slung it and he struck the Philistine in the forehead so that the stone sank into his forehead and fell on his face to the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone and struck the Philistine and killed him. But... There was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore, David ran, stood over the Philistine, took his sword, drew it out of his sheath, killed him, and cut off his head with it. He said exactly, he did exactly what he said he was going to do. He imagined it, and he set out, and he did it. Then it says, when the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. I can't, I don't believe this has happened out of chance. David saw exactly what he was going to do in his mind. Then he did it. If you want to remain in joy, you have to conceive in your mind. You have to conceive joy at the beginning. Then you'll birth joy. You'll reap joy. Thank you, Lord. I said I'd give you one more scripture, but I have another one. In Genesis chapter 13, verse 14, it says, The Lord said to Abram, after Lot had left him, Lift up your eyes and look from the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward, and westward. For the land that, the, for the, all the land which you see, I will give you and your descendants forever. Now, think, just think about this. Can you, use, can you use your brain and your head other than a coat rack for just a, or a hat rack just for one moment? Think about this. God told Abram, Look up your eyes. Lift up your eyes. Look as far as you can see, northward, eastward, southward, westward, to all the land you can see. I will give it to you, not just to you, all of your descendants forever. Do you know who you're a descendant from? You're Abraham's seed. I'm Abraham's seed. We are all descendants of Abraham. Now, the human eye 
can probably only look about eight or nine miles before the curvature of the earth starts to happen. How is it possible for Abraham or Abram at the time to see Visalia, California? I'm not making, the Bible says, God said, I will give you all the land that you can see to you and your descendants forever. We're here today because of Abraham and what he saw. If it was only limited to what he could naturally see, we'd be stuck over there in that little tiny place. All eight billion of us would be in that little concentrated place that was limited to his vision. He had to see with something else. He saw in here. But God said, look at the, the, the sand on the ground. Look at the stars in the sky. So shall your seed be. As many people, as many stars that are in the sky, as much sand that's on the ground, those will be the number of your descendants. Abraham needed to rely on something not natural to see all the land that God would give him and his descendants. I hope you're seeing this, the power of the imagination. The last verse I want to give you, Hebrews 11 says, if they would have truly, if they would have called to mind that country from which they came out of, they would have had an opportunity to return. This is talking about Abraham. It's talking about him and Sarah leaving the place that, that they were at, where God said, leave, get out of your tent, leave. If they would have brought back to memory, if they would have remembered where they came from, they would have had the opportunity to return to it. You ever asked yourself, man, I wish we were back in the good old days. Remember the good old days when gas was low, we had a good president, and the economy was, was thriving. Remember the good old days in 1990? Remember the good old days in 2000? Careful, because that might cause you to stop moving forward. You're imagining the past. Start imagining the future. Start using your imagination for what's to come. Let me tell you, church, we're living in the good old days. These are the good old days. Amen? We're going to get to heaven one of these days and go, man, remember the good old days? Remember back in 2010? Remember back in 2020, the good old days? Remember the good old days in 2030? Remember the good old days in 2045? Our entire life, when we get to heaven, will be a good old day. And that day when we're in heaven is going to be the great day, the best day ever. Don't get stuck by imagining the past because it will cause you to not look towards the future and be expecting and be hopeful for what God will do then. Amen.